There are many diseases that are linked to mitochondrial dysfunction, and these include diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, ALS, Parkinson's disease, and possibly many more. Now, mitochondria are these small organelles, these powerhouses in our cells that are tasked with making ATP, the energy currency that we need to drive all our cellular processes. And it usually works like this. You've seen this diagram in biology. There's a sugar, a glucose molecule coming in. And through the Krebs cycle uh, or citric acid cycle in the mitochondria, we have the production of a lot of ATP. And when we have um, you know, mitochondria that are working well, they make a lot of energy. They can also um, use other substrates. They can use, for example, fatty acids. So when someone goes on a ketogenic diet where there's no sugar available, then the mitochondria can function very well um, using fatty acids, actually, uh, ketone bodies, in order to produce energy. So these are pathways that normal, healthy mitochondria can do. And um, I'm going to show a diagram here. There were studies done uh, about you know, cancer. And I did a talk that's called metabolic therapy, where I'm talking about the theory here that actually cancer may in fact arise from malfunctioning uh, uh, mitochondria that then downstream damage the DNA you know, through oxidants that are released. And that is very possible that it goes this way and it makes a lot of sense because when you look at the diagram here, you can clearly see they took uh, you know, a cancer cell and with a cancer nucleus and cancer organelles. So you have damage in the DNA, which is what we thought was always the prime cause of a cancer cell, where, how it would divide uncontrollably. We have sufficient damage to the DNA. And at some point, some of these safeguards where the cell says, hey, I'm, I'm limiting my ability to divide and the rate of division is kicked out and the cell divides uncontrolled at a very high rate. And that is actually something that we see in cancer cell that's correct. But the question is, is that how it starts or is this a downstream manifestation? The metabolic theory says, well, this is downstream because it starts with the mitochondria. And we know that a cancer cell not only has damage in the DNA, but also has damaged mitochondria. And that is actually something that is a hallmark of all cancer cells, really of all cancer cell lines of different cancers, that the mitochondria are damaged. And they're damaged in a way where the mitochondria are much more primitive in their functionality. Instead of using this elaborate citric acid cycle, making a whole bunch of ATP, they can only ferment. And fermentation is a real poor and a, a shitty energy balance where you take a sugar molecule and you produce a very few ATP only. Therefore, cancer cells need a lot of sugar, they need a lot of glucose to make sufficient energy because their rate is very low. Now, um, the other substrate that we found out more in recent years that cancer cell can use, and this varies from cancer type to cancer type, is glutamine. And glutamine is a non-essential amino acid. It means an amino acid that our own body can produce. So it's difficult to limit that, but we can actually decrease the availability. And this is where metabolic theory uh, therapy comes in. Knowing that cancer cells cannot use fatty acids, for example, like our healthy cells. Again, if you go on a ketogenic diet, you withhold all your sugar or your glucose or your carbohydrates, the body is forced to burn ketone bodies and it actually burns cleaner. So the citric acid cycle produces a lot of pollutants. Think of this as a gasoline burning engine sort of, whereas burning ketone bodies actually produces less or, or no pollutants, more like an electric engine running. I don't think people should be on that indefinitely or for prolonged periods of time, but it's something that our body certainly can handle. And I think for periods of time, it's actually a healthy or, or very healthy thing to do. And it might be a life-saving thing to do if someone has cancer. And the reason for that is, again, when we think of metabolic theory here, saying these mitochondria are not functioning well, they can only ferment, they can only ferment glucose and in some cases, glutamine. If we take both of those um, substrates away, the cell will starve and die. The cancer cell will die because it cannot sustain itself. And that actually turns out to be true. So going on a ketogenic diet and then periodically blocking glutamine or decreasing the amount of glutamine that is available, that essentially is metabolic ther uh, therapy. And again, that's in the video I talk about that, that's something that uh, is very um, a new sort of thinking of this. And it works, I think, extremely well. We've seen papers how people have benefited from metabolic therapy. And in my opinion, it's something that can always be used together with traditional treatments that we still have in, of course, surgery, chemotherapy, and so on to uh, treat active cancer. So again, mitochondria in cancer cells uh, are deficient and your nucleus has mutations. Now, when they take one of those cells, as you see in the diagram, where they now take a healthy cell with healthy DNA, so there's no cancer mutation in the DNA, 
and they put that into a cancer cell with the cancer mitochondria that can only ferment, the cell stays in fact a cancer cell. It divides, it continues to divide as a cancer cell. It's not healthy. Now, um, by contrast, if you take a um, cancer nucleus, so with damaged DNA, and put it into a healthy cell, a cell that has healthy organelles, healthy mitochondria, then this cell now divides like a healthy cell. So it is not a cancer cell anymore. And there we can see how profound uh, the influence is of the mitochondria on overall health of the cell. So mitochondrial health appears to be extremely important and cancer is just one of the examples. Again, there are many diseases that appear to be linked to mitochondrial dysfunction. Keeping our mitochondria healthy is in our interest because it keeps our whole body healthy. And it's something that is very much neglected. We know that as we um, become insulin resistant and we develop you know, early glucose intolerance or maybe even early type 2 type diabetes, our risk of cancer increases. And that is also linked to obesity. We know that diabetes is linked to obesity and cancer is linked to obesity and cancer is linked to diabetes. So we have a strong correlation here that shows when we have metabolic dysfunction. Um, and again, when you have uh, diseases like uh, diabetes and heart disease, you know, we call this also a metabolic syndrome where your whole uh, functionality actually of your cellular, uh, your cellular functionality is compromised, right? And with that, again, comes a higher risk of developing diseases like cancer, for example, right? Now, we know then um, that if we take care of our mitochondria, if we lose weight, if we eat better, if we decrease our simple sugar intake, if we normalize our hemoglobin A1C, and if we you know, are not insulin resistant anymore, we are doing better and our chances of diseases like cancer and others are decreasing significantly. So taking care of our mitochondria is, I think, hugely important. And therefore, we have to understand what is damaging them and what is good for them. And these are, I think, very important points, right? Now, they can become damaged by normal aging, of course. You know, that's something that we know. Uh, oxidants, right, that we're exposed to, so pollutants. Seed oils, alcohol, toxic metals, you know, organic pollutants. We'll be talking here about uh, pesticides and herbicides and so on. Some prescription drugs actually can uh, negatively impact our mitochondria as well as, well, recreational drugs which shouldn't be taken anyway. Some examples here are Tylenol, aspirin, uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, and statins. I never thought I would say all those in one sentence, but all those can be damaging to our mitochondria, and we should be aware of that. And when we're taking prescription medications, um, I'm always pointing out that we should always periodically discuss with our primary care doctor, hey, can I do something to improve my health that I can maybe lower that medication? Or can we just reevaluate after a while I've been on this medication if I still need it or if I at least in, uh, could get away with a lower dose, right? These are all helpful things. A lot of times that's sort of neglected. Uh, of course, it's in the interest of the pharma industry to keep people indefinitely on medication. That's not in your interest. I think it's always good to minimize medications. That's not to say that we don't need them ever, but I think we usually need them in small amounts and a lot of things are quite overscribed. okay? So... There are seven strategies that have been very helpful um, to boost mitochondrial health. And the first would be our diet, what we eat. I would strongly suggest to cut out seed oils. And that's, of course, a bit controversial as usual. But seed oils are very rich in omega-6 linoleic acid. And that's been shown that high amounts of those can be damaging to our, our mitochondria. And they can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction and therefore linked to the diseases that I mentioned earlier. And um, there is actually, I mean, there are a lot of talks about this, a lot of papers about this. I think it's important to understand that seed oils are just not good for us in general. And uh, seed oils, we're talking about, you know, soybean oil, cotton seed oil. We're talking about um, sunflower oil, safflower oil, and so on. Uh, and I would leave all those out. Uh, canola oil as well. And stick with normal simple fats in small amounts, like we're talking about avocado oil, olive oil, if it's 100% pure. Go for extra virgin oil here. This is the first press, which is the best oil. Small amounts of butter are okay as well. Then simple sugars. And that's the issue again, because we're thinking about um, early glucose uh, intolerance or early diabetes, strongly linked to consumption of simple sugars. Because again, when we take in simple sugars, we need a massive spike of um, insulin release from the pancreas. And over time, the pancreas can burn out and we get less and less response to the sugar as we gain weight. Uh, our resistance to the insulin goes up because it's directly linked to the amount of body fat that we have. So it doesn't work so good anymore. And over time, we burn out the pancreas and we develop insulin resistance and diabetes, right? 
That again, metabolic disorder, very strongly linked to higher risk of cancer, significantly higher risk of cancer actually. So cutting out simple sugars, decreasing carbohydrates in general, my recommendation usually is taking less than about 150 uh, grams of carbohydrates a day. And that's actually very achievable and easy to do, especially when we cut out simple sugars. Carbohydrates that are certainly okay are fruit in moderation, of course. Uh, berries are my preferred fruit because they have a low glycemic index, um, but others are fine in moderation as well. And then, you know, a few whole grains here and there I don't think hurt. Not the greatest thing. I don't think we need them definitely, but, you know, there's some fiber in there, which is probably good for us. So there are a few things that we can take in, but we can minimize this. Some rice here and there, a bit of pasta once in a while. I think that's all fine. Number two, supplements. Some supplements that have shown positive effect in our mitochondria are, for example, coenzyme Q10. It's always questionable how much of that gets in, I must say. Um, the manufacturers will say, oh, there's a high absorption rate. But when we talk about oral bioavailability, so the percentage of that certain substance that gets actually into our cells, that can really vary from product to product. You know, a lot of it can be broken down in the dig digestive tract. Some of it might not get absorbed. It depends on how we take it with a meal or without a meal. So again, we can, I think, uh, it's a supplement worth uh, using. You know, I would always discuss any supplement, of course, with your primary care doctor first, but um, it's something that might be helpful for mitochondrial health. Um, our alpha lipoic acid has been studied and shown to be good for mitochondrial health, vitamin E, vitamin D3, and K2. Those are the ones that I would recommend. And I do take vitamin D3 and K2, and I do take vitamin E, and once in a while, our alpha lipoic acid as well. So that's something that you can explore that can be um, helping your mitochondria in terms of supplements. Then um, increase, sorry, decrease your exposure to toxins. And that's, of course, uh, yeah, goes without saying. Heavy metals can be damaging to mitochondria, so avoid those. Stay away from uh, pesticides, herbicides. So buy organic if possible. I know this is more expensive. I prefer to buy smaller quantities, um, it, but rather it be organic because, again, especially when it comes to uh, wheat and other things, uh, a lot of the stuff is sprayed. I don't buy corn at all because <laughs> that's all sprayed with glyphosate or 90% of it is. Um, but buying organic is good. If you buy uh, fruit like berries, you can get them frozen. So organic frozen fruit is significantly cheaper and it stays fresh for very long periods of time. Um, alcohol, I'm always uh, a big proponent of limiting alcohol. I always talk about this. I drink usually no more than about two drinks per week. If you drink on a daily basis, you may be damaging your mitochondria, in fact, right? Certain prescription drugs like statins can be damaging to mitochondria. Always discuss all your medications with your primary care doctor periodically and see that you take the minimum that you really need, right? And then, of course, recreational drugs, which we don't have to talk about, which you just <laughs> should not use at all. Fasting can improve the health of our mitochondria. Usually, it starts around 16 hours, but it's not like a cutoff thing. And that's always this confusion. People are saying, well, people do 18 hour intermittent fasting twice a week, and this will not cause autophagy, which is not helpful for the mitochondria. I think that's wrong. Um, I think that it's not, it doesn't start like a light, like a light switch that you turn on at 16 hours or so. There is autophagy even earlier, even at 12 to 14 hours, there's some. Uh, the longer you fast, of course, the better your, your results will be. But not everybody's going to do a two or three day fast. I think that's unrealistic. Um, so even short intermittent fasting of about 16 to 18 or 20 hours, once or twice a week, is very helpful in my opinion. And it certainly um, improves mitochondrial health, amongst other things, by autophagy. Now, autophagy is essentially programmed cell death. It's cell death of uh, old malfunctioning mitochondria. And then also there's, it, it, you know, there's a, a stimuli to produce more mitochondria, right? So we're weeding out old mitochondria and the cell is stimulated to produce more new mitochondria that are very healthy. So fasting can be actually very helpful in my opinion. Then uh, the fifth one is build muscle. So the more muscle you build, the more healthy mitochondria you will have. There's better oxygenation of tissue. I mean, there's so many advantages to building muscle in a healthy way. Of course, not with steroids or anything like that, but just, you know, regular working out, heavy lifting, right? And then mixed with some aerobic exercise. So exercise in general is good, but specifically building muscle has been shown to really improve mitochondrial health. Sleep. Very tough one because again, seven to nine hours, it's between seven and nine hours, it's what's recommended. That's tough to do. I fall on the, you know, seven hour, if I'm lucky, uh, sort of side of this. Um, some people have asked, well, what if I sleep a bit during the day? Yes, that can be helpful, can be helpful for hormones, but can possibly also be helpful for mitochondrial health. Like, have another 
half hour nap at least during the day. If you can, if you can make that happen. If you only sleep six hours a night, try to get a bit of extra sleep during the day. Ideally, you sleep longer through the night. That's true. But you can help out a little bit by having an extra nap in the daytime. And that might not be a bad thing to do, right? Um, and then, of course, near infrared radiation. I've done several videos about this. This is a fascinating topic. So near infrared radiation is not visible to the human eye. It's around 850 nanometers. It's what we perceive as warmth from sunlight. So when you're out in the sunlight and you feel the warmth of the sun, that's near infrared radiation. Now, the infrared radiation penetrates deep into the body, several inches. It goes through bone. It actually reaches your brain. It is uh, very, very helpful because the mitochondria exposed to near infrared radiation are actually um, stimulated to produce uh, melatonin. And we always think of melatonin in terms of sleep, right? As helpful for our sleep at night. But here, when we think about melatonin production in the mitochondria for our cells, this is for cellular health in general. So uh, when we're sleeping at night or when we're about to go to bed, usually the pineal gland in our brain is releasing a big amount of melatonin that goes in the bloodstream that helps us then, then, then sleep. This is different. Um, so here we have melatonin in the mitochondria in our cells, in, in, you know, and it helps the cell to become healthier. It also greatly improves the immune system. And during viral illnesses, and we've had this during our pandemic and in, in, when you have the flu, it is actually recommended that you take melatonin because we know that melatonin is actually very helpful for your immune system to, so, to help you really uh, recover a lot faster. So there is a direct link of uh, better recovery from viral illness and taken a melatonin supplement, right? But the best melatonin is, again, if we get it through near-infrared radiation. Now, you can get it from sunlight, or you can get it from a near-infrared and LED bed. And that's also very good. You know, I would usually do that in the wintertime when there's not enough sun. LED near-infrared panel or like a lie-down bed, which I prefer because it's much more intense, about three times a week and <clears throat> about 15 minutes. Very helpful. Again, recovers the... Uh, a lot of the mitochondria that are actually um, slightly damaged can actually recover from this. They produce more melatonin again, and actually they can become healthier. So these are very good things that we can do. So following these steps, we can really greatly improve our mitochondrial health and therefore really our overall health, right? And I always get the question, well, which one of these is the most profound effect we can have on our, our mitochondria? And I would really say being metabolically healthy, and that uh, means lower your body fat percentage, right? Check your hemoglobin A1C, check a fasting insulin, make sure that you're not insulin resistant, decrease carbohydrate intake, and then exercise. These are the best things that we can do. Everything else is important as well. Supplements may help, right? But it, the best thing we can do is losing body fat and becoming healthier.